Good morning. This is Daniel and Norma today with Park Talks. Thanks for joining us. Let's get, let's take a look at this. Something kind of important that we all use every single day. Our words. See if this sounds familiar. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That's a lie. Would you agree? Sometimes. Yeah. Interesting, this lie that we've accepted since we're very small, very young, um, is countered if we were to just open the Bible and look in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 18.21 tells us that the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Today in church we learned about honor quite heavily. We'll touch some of those parts a little later in this. Let's jump into this piece right here. This is, I read this story this week that kind of really stuck to me, and I would have to say was the fuel to this. This story is often told. It is the most unusual penance. St. Philip Neri assigned a woman for her sin of spreading gossip. In 16th century, the saint instructed her to take a feathered pillow to the top of the church bell tower rip it open, and then let the wind blow all of its feathers away. This probably was not the kind of penance that this woman or any of us would have been used to. But the penance didn't end there. Philip Neary gave her a second chance, and it was more difficult, a more difficult task. He told her to come down from the bell tower and to collect all the feathers that had been scattered through the town by the wind. The poor lady, of course, could not do it. And that was the point. Philip Neary was attempting to make in order to underscore the destructive nature of her gossip. When we detract from others in our speech, our, mal our malicious and malice words are scattered abroad and cannot be gathered back. They continue to dishonor and divide many days, months, or even years after we speak them, as they linger in the minds and pass from one tale bearer to the next. Where does that come from? When asking that question, I was led into Psalms, just for a bit of guidance here real quick. Psalms 9411, the Lord knows the thoughts of man, but they are but a breath. What lasts longer, your breath or your thought? Didn't we figure that about a year or so ago, we were doing a study on thoughts and there was over, what, 300,000 thoughts a human being has in a day? How many breaths do you take? I don't think it's that much. The average resting breath rate is between 13 and 15 per minute. I teach a lot of group fitness. I think there's a lot of them. Yeah, well, you're probably going to have a lot more than others. But let's take a look at how this actually works. What actually happened in Genesis 2-7, the last half? To refresh your memory, we'll look there. God breathed into the nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. Man, the dirt bag now became something. What does God give us that is the root cause of life? Breath. What do you call somebody who has no breath? Dead. So a statement without breath is then what? If you listen to Park Talks, you'll find I'll answer that for you. It's called a thought. You ever hear somebody say, the cat's got my tongue? Confusion. See if they're breathing. You might have said something that took their breath away. And it's stuck in thought. What will happen if your living consciousness, creature, being, and I use those words based out of different translations of the Bible in Genesis 2-7. And sometimes it says we became a living creature, a living consciousness, or a living being. Now, when that part receives judgment for every word, not deed, but every word that comes out of your mouth, where do you think that's going to land if your last words weren't forgive me, Lord? Proverbs 27, 19. As in water, face reflects face. So in the heart of man reflects the man. Does that specifically tell me if my heart is bitter, then my words will be bitter and sharp? Yeah. Without doubt. So if I have pain, I can easily pass pain? Yes. Because 
hurt dirt, as we've said many times in the past. Hurt dirt hurts dirt. That's all it knows. But just remember, our tongue is like a double-edged sword. It is a double-edged sword. Because in one side, I mean, uh, what was it in the book of James? Where it says that salt water and fresh water can't flow from the same spring. How can the same tongue that praises the Lord curse man? It comes out of the heart. The tongue cannot do anything without the consciousness activating it. From the depths of the heart, the mouth speaks. But for as a man is in his, in his thoughts, in his mind, so will he be in his heart. He's going to be in that way. How do we work on this? The way I have found, and I'm going to hit the scripture again, Psalms 139, 23. It's a wonderful prayer. And I would challenge people, pray this several times a day. Simple, simple little scripture. Search me. Oh God, know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. If God knows your thoughts and they're honoring to him, I assure you they'll be honoring to those around you. In truth, some people who are so lost in accepting fallacies as a reality, they'll be offended, but that's okay. Remember, when truth is tested, it confirms itself. It confirms that it's truth. If you don't believe in the truth of gravity, drop something over your head. Well, just remember this day and age, truth, truth is usually the thing that people least want to hear right. and are most offended by. Right. Now, that could be both sides. Remember you said uh, the, the tongue is a double-edged sword. So what if I'm delivering truth and I'm delivering it in a, in a sharp, jagged manner? A lot of people are rejected based upon that type of tone or your body right. language and such. Not necessarily always what it seems. Well, they reject it. Let me, let, me poss- let me offer this possible. Some people possibly don't reject it. They just build such a defense immediately based on your words or tone that nothing you say wants to, they want to hear. I would just offer that as a possibility, too. Um, we've, are, we've stated on the show many times on Park Talks how possibly people never rejected Christ or the message of salvation. They just reject the messenger because they're rude, arrogant, hypocritical. Think they're better than somebody else? Yes. Oh, you just think you know more than me, right? Words are a product of our thoughts. The breath flows past the vocal cords causing vibration. Then the tongue and the mouth form the words. So where'd they come from? Our thoughts. Dropped into our heart. They grew with emotions. And from the heart, it came straight out. In Ephesians 4.29, the Apostle Paul tells us specific, I mean, this is specifically, let, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. We often realize, or we often do not realize the power of our words. Our words can be used to build up or tear down. We can have a positive impact on other people's lives when we use words for good. Consider how much we appreciate it when somebody takes time to express words of gratitude, honor, or praise, or how enriched we are when somebody takes a genuine interest in our lives. Conversation that focuses on what is good and honorable can edify other people's lives and help strengthen those in the community. We tear down others when we point out their weaknesses, criticize them or complain about them. When we are not present, even when they're speaking and we're psychologically not present, we're lost in our own thought. We may, for example, start off speaking positively about someone, yet add a but in the middle of the sentence that proceeds our mentioning a certain fault or annoying point we think this person possesses, such as, he's a great guy, but sometimes he talks too much. Another one would be, I love mom, but sometimes she, can't, she can get on my nerves. Such detraction is not necessary and diminishes the honor that is due to the other person. First a lot step. of people don't see it that way, though. 
Well, a lot of people just see it as aimless talk. Empty words? Yeah. yeah. But if they're empty words and they have no meaning, why would they even need to be brought to life? If we are created, if we have the power to create, give life and give death, why would we offer death in our words? People don't think they need to be silent. Well, that's true. And also, I would wonder if many people even understand this reality. That would be a curious thought to entertain. You see, in 1 Thessalonians 5.11... Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. I think sometimes people get caught up in the moment of whatever else people are saying in a negative sort of tone. It's kind of like what we talked about last week. Mm -hmm. You get caught up with whatever is going on around you and you kind of join in and it's kind of hard to remove yourself from the situation. So let me add this, which These literally you felt... core and spawn between the two of them. What if... Backbiting, speaking ill, gossip, criticism is a sin. Just what if? In this, in this reading, I'll go on to say here, it says another sin of speech is backbiting, which denies or despairs one's good points. It speaks ill of another person when he or she is not present in order to blacken their good name, whereas detraction openly seeks to dishonor someone. Backbiting aims at depreciating one's reputation and it seeks to do so secretly. This can be done by speaking falsely about someone, presenting their, their faults as greater than they are in reality, or ascribing to bad intentions to one's good deeds. We can fall into backbiting, also by deliberately concealing or diminishes diminishing someone's, someone else's good qualities. We may also directly criticize another person whom we do not like, but we never mention that person's praiseworthy accomplishments or virtues to others because we do not want their reputation to be enhanced. According to Aquinas, backbiting, so this is a person who wrote um, oh. Sutra Theological, and the Theological Samutra, or something like that, I actually kind of read part of this book a few years back. It's a difficult read, but it's worth it. Back, he says backbiting is a moral sin, more serious than theft. That's one of his quotes. Well, that's because it can affect so many people. Oh, yeah, and it goes on. I mean, you steal one item from somebody right now, you affect them in the moment and the future use of that item. But if you backbite somebody, you can cast, I've heard of people cast, nasty rumors about individuals that were untrue and it carried them on for many years. It even caused many levels of investigation just to clear their name. When it comes to backbiting and talking about people that literally destroys their name, which takes Proverbs 22.1 and destroys it. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. A favor is better than gold and silver. Now, wait a minute. In the first part of that, it says a good name is chosen rather than riches. Well, if a person does good about their self, speaks truth, can somebody go ahead and just start something nasty about them? Something destructive? Didn't they do it with Jesus? Well, yeah, that's how he got crucified versus... To take away somebody's good name is more grave, of more of a grave offense than to take away their personal property, their own home. And how do we do it? One word at a time. Malice words. In Romans 12.10, we get specific directions to love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. How do we do that? By action? By thought? By writing something down? No, we do that by word. But we have to start by how we think of each other. It can't become a word. It will not become a word until it becomes a thought. Then when it goes through emotional center, let's see how your heart is. If your heart is online with honor, then the words will be uplifting. If your heart is online with dishonor, such as maybe somebody dishonored you, then it'll literally be destructive. In Galatians 5, 14 and 15, it says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
problem is Paul goes on to talk about it in 15 and he says, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Is it a new problem? Let's take it all the way back to Deuteronomy 8.3. And he humbles you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. For he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. Again, we're dealing with the word. If God's going to speak truth and you want people to see God in your life, you better be speaking truth. And I don't mean half truth, manipulated truth, truth on every day but Sunday. I mean truth, consistent truth every day. In 1 Corinthians 15, 34, wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. But I say, this is your shame. So now if we know what to do and how to do it, yet we don't do it, that's shame. Yeah, and we'll read it a little later. It's also considered sin in Hebrews. Practice makes perfect. Only proper, perfect practice makes perfect. If you practice the same thing incorrectly, you'll always be incorrect. If I'm aiming at a target and I'm shooting over my left shoulder and the target's in front of me, I can practice it all day long. I'm just wasting ammo and looking stupid. It has to be proper practice. The vice of detraction consists of disclosing without good reason another's faults or failings to persons who did not need to know them. According to St. Thomas Aquinas, using injurious words with the intention of dishonoring somebody is sinful. Words that expose someone's fault to the detriment of his or her honor thus should generally be avoided. Just because a certain statement might be true doesn't mean I should say it. Doesn't the Apostle Paul tell us also that just because something is okay to be taken into the body doesn't mean it needs to be or it's good to be? If I were to tell others about a person's hidden faults, even if they were truly weaknesses of his, this would be to the detriment of his honor, since now these faults would be in most people's minds when they thought of him and overshadowed his honor. That is due him instead of giving him the honor he deserves. Others might now dwell more on this person's particular faults and failings than who they are at the core. There may be some circumstances in which speaking of a person's faults is not done with the intent to dishonor him or her, but for some good purpose, for example, to correct a person or to protect the community. Yet even in these cases, a person should delicately choose his words with great discretion and moderation. I do know somebody was told to me about an individual I bumped into occasion a few times, told me that he, uh, this older male enjoyed younger children. Nothing to my knowledge except the words that were told me. Every time I see that man, it's exactly what goes through my head. Mother Teresa of Calcutta once needed to discuss with her close advisors a disciplinary issue involving one of the sisters in her community. She began the conversation by reminding them to speak carefully and not say anything that did not need said. She led them in a prayer asking God to keep them to speak gently about this particular, situa this particular sister, pointing out that it was, it was as if they were holding her in the palm of their hand as they spoke about her. Though gossip, distraction, backbiting, and tail bearing can cause injury to others' good name and divide people from, which, from each other, God intended that we use our speech for good. When our conversation is charitable and focused on what is true, good, and beautiful, it edifies others and builds deeper communication with people. The following exhortation of the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians is also quite an acceptable way to approach our conversations. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is, and this is Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything praiseworthy, think about these things. Why don't we do that? Does it make 
an individual feel stronger, taller, better if they beat somebody else down. A lot of times that's what people are doing, though. Yep. Um, so let's take a couple of old sayings. We've heard birds of a feather flock together. Okay. So if somebody's depressed, angered, hurt, they're going to want to be able to hand that into somebody else. We've also heard that misery loves company. And I caveat that by saying, but company doesn't love misery. It's easy to get wrapped up in the backbiting stories of they said, she said, that's not good enough, he's not good enough, that's not satisfactory, that's rude, that's mean. But let's look at the difference in dishonor and honor. If we're going to use our words, dishonor does what? Well, my understanding, dishonor assumes the worst in others. Dishonor likes to get mad and angry fast. It insults, it argues, and it fights. It's extremely opinionated. It assumes. It treats others as ordinary or common. What would honor look like? It communicates. It shares. It uplifts others. It will not fight or argue. It informs. It loves others. The pastor shared these this morning, and I couldn't help but grab them. Respect is earned. Honor is given. Same thing in our, in our words. Honoring others is following the scripture, and those will become more honorable who honor the scripture. When your words honor, it points light to people. It points your light towards people. Remember, dishonor tears down, it hurts others. It will cause others to fall and fail in their relationship. Honor also builds up, dishonor tears down. Now, the harsh part about all this is when we put it all together, you gotta ask yourself, this is, could be new information for some people, could be something they've heard before, read before, but now that it's in your thoughts and you understand how words can tear people down and destroy those around you, those you wanna bring honor to, even the ones that you don't agree with, you can disagree and still be honorable. We wrap Hebrews 10, 26, and 27 around it. And it kind of locks it in a little tighter for me personally. For if we go on sinning deliberately after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sac there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. We've all spoken out of turn. We probably all said something that we shouldn't have about somebody. Responded in heat, hostility, anger, frustration. Forgiveness actually heals you from the inside out. If you want to use words, speak words of healing, forgiveness, peace, love, joy, long-suffering, meekness, kindness, goodness. Be gentle. Be self-control. This is Daniel and Norma with Park Talks this week. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Be blessed.